Okay, so thank you so much for joining us, Eric. I'm really excited to get into our topic today. Um, we are going to be discussing how schools can use SEL, social, social emotional learning to address behavioral issues. And so let's go ahead and get started with some introductions. Um, my name is Zoe Kelly. I'm an SEL expert for Tomo Club. We deliver SEL game-based curriculum. And so I help facilitate the, um, the live classes that we do with schools. And I am here with Eric Hudspeth. And go ahead and introduce yourself, Eric. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Eric Hudspeth. I'm the superintendent for Waseca Public Schools. A school district in southern Minnesota, we serve approximately 1,800 students in grades K through 12, as well as a, a full pre-K and a, an adult learning, learning um, uh, group for us as well. So we're excited to be part of this conversation. One of the things that we're passionate about in Wasika is all students being successful and really living that all means all mentality of making sure that every student gets what they need. And uh, this SEL conversation is an important one because we know how much students' uh, needs extend beyond reading and math and other content areas. It, revol it, it involves their interaction with life as well. So we're, I'm excited to be part of, part of the conversation talking with you. Yeah, great. And likewise, you know, with Toma Club, we see so much growth when we focus specifically on SEL um, as you know, um, approaching it as we would a math class or a science class, uh, something that builds on itself. And uh, so, you know, we've seen the impact on, on you know, behavior, on just uh, growth in general, especially when we think of, you know, students' uh, uh, social growth. We, we see a lot of that. Uh, when we focus uh, specifically on SEL. So um, my first question to you is, I, I've, I see that you were a teacher for a long time, you were a principal. Um, what has been your uh, personal experience with uh, behavioral issues and, and maybe how they've changed over um, the course of, of your time? Certainly. Well, I started my career as a kid. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, I started my career as a kindergarten teacher and I taught and I taught kindergarten for the first several years of my career. And then I moved and I taught sixth grade language arts uh, for for several years before I left the classroom into administration. And um, essentially working with those earliest learners, our youngest learners, a big part of that kindergarten experience is what is school? And how do you interact with peers and how do you manage conflict? How do you be aware of your own self and your own body? And so innately in those younger years, you're teaching it through the interactions you're having and through what you're doing with students. And, and I would say that, you know, one thing I would, I, I would, I would explain that students haven't changed in the sense that kids are still kids, but the world they live in has vastly changed. The world compared to the late 90s, early 2000s, when I began my career, is different in 2024. The amount of stress, the amount of distraction, the amount of uh, social challenges that kids are being placed under um, is vastly different than the, earlier in my career. And so that, that manifests sometimes in behavior. And it's not so much because a student chooses to make a poor choice, but it's because they just don't know what else to do. Right. And as we talked about in the very beginning of our conversation, we teach content area, we teach math, we teach reading, but we don't necessarily take a specific with a scope and sequence time to teach um, social and emotional and behavioral skills as much. I think we're getting that direction. And through our conversation, I'll share a little bit what we're doing in Wasika. And, and Tomo Club's a big part of trying to get that word out there for for um, for students and schools and how that happens in a more of a natural game based play based mm -hmm. on the interactions I've had. Um, but I think the most important part is we're doing it intentionally mm -hmm. and we're not just leaving it to a social experience for students to develop those skills. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought up uh, working with younger students because I originally started in uh, and infant through preschool. I worked through Head Start and a big part of that, I mean, arguably the largest part is social emotional learning in, in all its different uh, in all its different ways. And we do intentionally teach it, you know, um, all day, you know, whether we're, we are teaching math or, uh, you know, uh, the, the beginning of reading skills, we're doing it in a way where we're teaching students to interact with each other, we're, we're we're focusing on, you know, them dealing with frustrations. 
and it's done in a really intentional way. And I think that the math and the, and, um, and science and reading is kind of like the secondary part and, and very early education. And then instantly when they go into kindergarten, it switches and it's such uh it's such a stark transition. And it's always seemed a shame to me that, um, the the social emotional learning skills are kind of put to the side and that intentionality is lost so quickly um and so i think that especially with like you're saying the world changing uh around you know these students that becomes even more important right to to bring that bring back that intentionality uh for our students Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And if you can't interact with other people effectively or be aware of your own emotions and what you're feeling inside, it becomes awfully hard to focus on what you're trying to learn from a content perspective. Um, it's not unlike the concept of food insecurity. If a student's hungry, it's have a hard time, hard, hard time learning. And I think of emotional regulation and support in that area in a similar regard. Some students are starving. for the ability to have that emotional regulation, to know what is normal to feel, what is stress versus anxiety, because those are two different things. But if we teach those intentionally, students can navigate those, those learning opportunities much more effectively. Definitely. And I think that it becomes really clear the students who have had exposure to, to that and those who haven't. Um, I see it in my own classes, um, especially when we bring up tough emotions. There are some students who are like, I'm feeling this, this and this, you know, they can name it instantly. And other students who just become, you know, they, they don't even know how to respond to that. And, and I think, And I think that, um, you know, being able to engage in those conversations is how we deal with a frustration in a healthy way, how we deal with conflict management. And I think that, you know, as we get into talking about how it addresses behavioral issues, I think that is one aspect in which it really um, benefits the students. So my next question is um, with social emotional learning in general, um, what is your experience with SEL? Um, I know it's had a lot of different names over the years. I mean, generally we're just speaking about life skills, right? And, and uh, how we interact our, our relationships uh, with one another. What, is, what does that look like? Um, and you can speak directly in your school district or just in general in your experience. Right. Well, I, and I think you're right. It's social emotional learning or some variation of, of behavior, behavior support. We used to call it probably behavior management and behavior intervention um, has been around for a long time. Um, the last several years, we've talked about giving it a name. Social emotional learning is something that's newer. Um, but right now we do things very intentionally in Wasika. So in our, we, our youngest learners are in our kindergarten through third grade uh, building, and they do a program with their all tier one um, core instruction involves um, some character work and mm -hmm. how we work through um, interacting with others, managing conflict and, and engaging in, in, in social emotional regulation. Uh, in our fourth, fifth, and sixth grade building, it's it's much the same. It's building upon that. But now we're dealing with a lot of peer interactions mm -hmm. and a lot of how we're, we're now getting away from the nest, if you will, those fifth and sixth graders. And how do we manage that conflict without mom or dad helping every, or a teacher helping every time? There's still times for that, but not every time. And then we happen to have a junior, senior high. So we have our seventh through 12th graders in one school. And so through It's a version of homeroom we call Blue Jay Connect, where Blue Jay's here in Mosica, and, and they meet daily and they talk about life skills and they have a monthly theme and grade level goals. And that's something that our teachers came up with because they knew it was really important. Uh, we were seeing some challenges with our seventh and eighth grade students transitioning to a high school in just seventh grade, they need to be treated like middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. And so working through that, uh, through that, something our staff has been able to create. So my experience, and, and we're seeing growth. We're seeing significant growth. We, we have students who have the need for behavioral support, but it's when you have a, a social emotional learning plan in place, nearly every, because there's always a caveat, but nearly every behavior incident can be a learning and teaching experience, can be a growth experience. It's not a, um, we have a phrase here that I've known for a long time, but we use it from time to time. We don't throw away kids. Mm -hmm. 
we're going to get every kid across the finish line. And that means that a lot of behavior support has to be a teaching opportunity and be able to support you for the next time. So that's easier to do when you have a structure in place. And that's what I think the social emotional curriculums and resources and various opportunities that we have um, access to has made a huge difference in my career. Because when you're just kind of coming up with it as the classroom teacher or as a grade level team, that becomes much more challenging. Where I think we can, can even get better is then aligning throughout a system. And as a school district, we've been working the last two years on ensuring that we use the same positive behavior intervention supports, PBIS and MTSS, uh, with a multi-tier structure of support of aligning that language throughout our entire system so that when you're in second grade, you're hearing the same language as seventh grade. And so that way you, you're that, like you used the word scaffolding a while ago, um, when you scaffold those things, um, it just creates that much more growth. So I'm seeing it now as superintendent, which is exciting, uh, but I had the opportunity to experience it in the classroom um, when I was in the classroom as a building principal, I was an elementary principal. So I had kindergarten through fifth graders and kindergarten through sixth graders in the two buildings I was principal of. And that applies to all students in those in, in any grade level. So I think it's it's fun. It, it's a it's a positive thing. I use the word fun, but I don't know if that's the right word, but it's a positive thing, I think, the seeing the structures being put in place. So school districts that may not have had the resources in the past now have those partners they can work with rather than their staff just having to pick up one more thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I love I love what you said. Uh, you guys don't throw away your students or throw away kids. Because I think this whole idea of when using SEL to address behavioral issues speaks to how do you discipline your students or how do you um, how do you go about resolving uh, issues? And I think, you know, uh, there's a big movement around restorative justice practices within schools. Um, you know, there's a big pushback these days uh, around suspending students, expelling students, especially, um, you know, in in districts who have had a high rate of, of uh, you know, uh, suspension and expulsion in the past. And so I think that um, when we look at behavioral issues as a way to grow, um, we, are, we are pushing back against the traditional punishment uh, mentality uh, around behavioral issues. And so with SEL, um, you've integrated it into your school. Um, how have you seen that reducing uh, behavioral issues? Like, do you have any um, like specific examples of where that's really benefited? Um, you know, using SEL within your school versus um, you know more punitive practices. Yeah, we see we see it in, in two primary ways and two pieces of data that we've looked at in the last year that have been pretty exciting. And, and the first is is our suspension and exclusion data. We we suspend minimal students, particularly at the elementary level, um, for you know, those outbursts and, and what you call the old we used to call it the disruptive and defiant uh, behavior. We don't see that in our elementary schools as often because we're teaching that emotional regulation and teaching that support. Um, what we often find too is it's not so much about the volume of suspension because I think administrators do an exceptional job of being um, using good judgment and, ex and ex suspending or, or excluding kids when it's absolutely necessary. Where I've seen a lot of growth in is the gap in students who are being suspended has has closed from those who are more at risk being suspended a lot more because it's it's probably not surprising to anyone but the students who are receiving the most punitive discipline or suspensions are those that have the least amount of opportunity to have learned those skills at home or learn those skills outside of school and so if they've not been intentionally taught is it surprising to anyone that they're the most disruptive students in our school probably not and so what I see is a, a closing of that gap um, between our students who are most at risk and just the students who make mistakes on any given day, because that's how it, that, that's that's how life goes. Uh, uh, school is a safe place to make a mistake and learn. Mm -hmm. And so are we ever, is it a push towards zero suspensions or discipline? No, I don't think so, because students have to have the opportunity to learn, to have consequences from time to time. But we want that to be a learning opportunity, not a punitive opportunity. The second thing that I think is most exciting for us 
is what we're seeing is we do, um, so we do some internal surveys on student belongingness and how students feel um, supported and safe at school. And we've seen about a 30% increase in the last two years in the number of students who say, I feel safe at school. I know an adult cares about me. I have a, a trusted adult and, and go to, and moving forward. And, I, and we were not in a position where we had problems where I felt like there were students who were in significant risk, but to see that get in the up and close to 85, 90% of our students are feeling like compared to 60% feeling like I have an trusted adult. I belong. The adults care about me. That, that has to do with SEL too. That has to do with the intentional discussion around we're all a group. We're all a, um, a family unit, if you will, at, um, here in our school. Yeah, that's beautiful. And and I think that that speaks to the idea that SEL really is a preventative practice. And so um, it's not, I, I, I guess I wouldn't look at SEL um, initially as a response to behavioral issues, um, like in the immediate way, but as a preventative measure of behavioral issues. And I think that when you, um, when you see results, like I feel like I belong, I mean, that's really addressing a lot of the issues that students have is that they don't always have a place or someone to feel like they can express, um, whatever's going on inside of them. That is often what's causing the behavioral issues. Or like you said, maybe they've just never been exposed to, um, anyone to teach them, uh, how to deal with a uh, conflict, how to deal with, uh, big emotions inside. And so, um, that's, that's really great that, that you've seen such positive, uh, impact through there. And so, especially when we think about kids who, um, deal with mental health issues, um, I think it's deeply tied with uh, how we teach social emotional learning um, and how we how we address mental health at school. Um, does your district collaborate with mental health professionals or, um, you know, or maybe even just curriculum uh, experts to support SEL? We, we do. And so we have a, a, a pretty I would say I'm proud of the robust student support system that we have. So. When we think about overall student support, particularly for mental health, we think about, so we have, we have counselors, we have social workers, school psychologists, school nurses are part of that conversation. But we also partner with some local therapeutic agencies to come into our buildings and work with our students when they need that support for regulation. And, and those are not, um, that's not a medical conversation. That's a conversation around some emotional regulation. And so that is when it comes to the SEL and instructional uh, instruction on how to support this particular conversation at the time. How do I respond to this situation? And we have that support for our students. And so we also partner locally with, with local public health. Our, our Waseca County Public Health is a fantastic partner. Um, they're consistently looking at what's happening in our community around us and giving us information by, and vice versa. Uh, regular meetings we have with them as well uh, to support our students in that way. Because I think you're right. It, it, it's all about the preventative wraparound for students to support them before we have a crisis, before we have any situation. And uh, mental health is one of those, it's an it's a extremely important topic. But what we learned from our students in the Waseca County this last spring, our Waseca Public Health partnered with us on a, on a study. Um, our students didn't know what was normal stress mm -hmm. and what was a problem. And so social emotional learning uh, instruction has helped them to understand that life is going to be stressful and there's going to be moments when I'm nervous or I'm anxious or scared or angry, but that doesn't mean I have a mental health necessarily long-term concern or a diagnosis, if you will, but there is a point where it tips over that edge and what is that normal? And so for our high school students, particularly, we're spending some time helping them understand what is grit and resiliency for, and what is just too much? And now mm -hmm. you're now you're over the line, and we we care about your mental health more than that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to understand that difference as well, because life is not going to ever get stress free, and it's never going to become um, without those emotions and anger and all those things you have. But understanding what's the tipping point is not something that comes natural for most people. People just I've, I've seen a lot of students and adults just bottle it up and think this is just normal. 
And so when we have the conversation, and that's more than normal. We can support you in this way. The weight comes off the shoulders so in, so incredibly that the success just comes from that, right? So I think that's a big part of how SEL, and on that line, um, our adults that work with kids also benefit from the SEL instruction. Because when you're working so closely, closely with the students, let's say you have a classroom of sophomores in high school, and you're working through, you know, a particular topic on resiliency, how can you not be impacted by that as the adult and take that in there and positive relationships with the students as well and each other. So I think it benefits more than just students. It benefits our schools at a, as a whole as well. Absolutely. Um, okay. Two parts. I love everything yeah. you said. Um, <laughs> First, um, I really appreciate you taking out the black and white of a situation um, when you talk about um, what is normal and what goes over the edge. I think it's really important that we are teaching students stress is going to happen. Um, you're going to be you're going to get upset about things. You're going to not like a situation. You're going to come up to a decision where neither choice is really ideal, but how do you choose which one is still the best option? Um, and that's a lot of what we talk about with students um, uh, in, in our classes. A lot of it's just validating. Look, it's okay that you're feeling this way. What do we do next? You know, what's then what? Um, it's okay that you had an argument with a student. What do we do after that? Um, and then it really helps students feel like, okay, I'm I'm familiar with this feeling. I'm comfortable with it now. Well, comfort is may, is maybe subjective, but I'm familiar with it enough to know how to address it. And then it does help ultimately when we come up with situations where it is too much or where um, we don't know how to deal with it and we really need help. Um, and I think that uh, it, it is hard for people these days to know um, what is normal and what is um, kind of goes beyond and starts, um, you know, when we think of mental health uh, disorders, they're disorders that prevent us from living our life in a, in a healthy and normal way, right? But, um, you know, if we never find out um, where that normal is, how do we know um, when we need to seek help? Uh, and so, uh, the other aspect I love that you talked about is integrating teachers um, into SEL as well. And, and I think that's very important because students, they know uh, when a teacher, when an adult, when anyone is being um, is speaking from the heart, is speaking from experience. And so when teachers um, are, are trying to, um, you know, talk about uh, social emotional learning um, competencies, you know, uh, I think that there's a level of, of awareness for students. Does this teacher walk the walk, right? Um, if a teacher is trying to teach about respect, yet they don't show respect to their students, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna come across right. Um, and so I love that, um, you know, when schools do focus on social emotional learning for both teachers, staff, administration, and students. Um, so that's, that's really great. Yeah. One of the things we've done this year in Wasika Public Schools, we focus on what our purpose is. And we've, we've talked to our staff at length about why are you a teacher and what is your purpose? What is your core mission? And it goes beyond what is your why? I want to help all kids. No. What is it that you, <laughs> that you really drives you? What is your mission as a person? And bring that to the classroom and bring that authenticity into your students. And when you bring, and it could be for whatever reason, it's not my role to judge that necessarily. But as a, if you really know what you're about as a teacher, kids recognize that and you, you are hundred percent correct. They, they can see how much you care and you don't have to know everything, but as long as they know you care, children are so are usually the most forgiving beings you will ever see with because and they just see the world as everyone's just a part of the team um, as long as you're in it as long as you in it you care and when you're working through these social emotional topics with students um, it does take some staff some time to feel like there's some buy-in at times because it feels like is this time we should be spending but it doesn't take very long to see some of those results and 
we have very, very few teachers, if any, quite frankly, anymore, who aren't in the game when it comes to our SEL things. Yeah, and I think that when you approach it, um, uh, you have to really be thoughtful about the way you integrate SEL into schools. I think sometimes when, uh, you know, teachers were there's already so much on their plate. And when we add, you know, a whole new curriculum or, or a whole new aspect of what they have to integrate into the class, it's usually a hard sell, no matter what the topic, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, there's really thoughtful ways to integrate SEL. Um, that is actually one reason in Tomo Club that we started providing teachers was because um, it's hard to um, convince teachers to, to adopt a whole new curriculum. But then we also found that um, once we were in the classrooms, the teachers want to be a part of it. And so most teachers, I would say, are, end up basically co-teaching with me because it's, it's a great subject. I mean, people want to talk about, um, you know, what makes them them, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I think that's been a really fun way to integrate it is kind of like, okay, we'll take care of most of it. And then they experience and they're like, wait, this is actually great. <laughs> this is helping right. in so many other aspects of, of, uh, of the classroom. Um, and even with professional development. I think that's how that started with Tomo Club was, um, you know, we were in the schools with students and teachers were like, we need something like this, you know, like I need ways to be able to talk to my coworkers, to talk to um, the administrative staff um, about tough issues or about things that you know, are, aren't working for uh, in the classroom. And so uh, that's kind of how our professional development got started as well. Um, so what kind of future plans do you guys have as far as um, SEL initiatives in your district? Do you, are you guys um, adapting it or are there new things that you've got on your horizon? Yeah, so we're working hard right now in aligning in Minnesota uh, uses the MTSS language, so multi-tier system of support. So we're working through with our Department of Education. We've been had the opportunity to be to be work with our MDE on aligning our systems K-12 for mm -hmm. MTSS. And one of the things that we're looking at right now is taking the, the 712, we call it connect for our SEL, as well as our K-3 and our 4-6, both use different programs um, that, they are, that they use and creating a more of an aligned language that matches our overall system uh, K-12. So that's a big part of our, our processes is to make sure that we are, now we're creating a vertical, um, a vertical scale for our students, scope and sequence, if, if you will, to get our way from kindergarten and pre-K all the way up through our 12th graders and beyond. And so for us, our next step is really strategically uh, planning how that looks. So we do, um, and, and here's where we, we put our our money where our mouth is, if you will. Um, one of our strategic priorities is, is to have a safe and welcoming school district. That's one of the things our school board has charged us with. This is one of your four uh, key areas. And then one of our measurements on our district vision cards, which are, we call them vision cards, they're like school improvement plans or action cards. And we use those. And one of those is the student belongingness that I mentioned earlier, as well as a staff uh, feeling heard and valued measure on there. So one of the things we're doing now is taking that feedback and looking at how we, how do we learn more about what that data tells us? So um, a student responding, I don't feel safe at school. And then there's, there's an emotion that gets evoked there as the adult, but then about intruders and whatever else you might talk about. But then when you ask that fifth grader, why don't you feel safe? Because I don't like walking home in the dark. Or I don't know if anyone's going to be home when I get home, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm I'm so I don't feel safe when I'm at school for that reason, mm -hmm. and so then we are now breaking that down with our counselors, social workers, and 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 classroom staff on how do we support students and really learning about them as people, and so we've we've gone away from a survey and gone to one or one to one interview for those for those pieces, particularly with our younger students. So they can really tell us what they're thinking and feeling. So then we can introduce um, what at our at Hartley, which is our kindergarten through third grade building, we can introduce, you know, grade by grade content based on what we're hearing from our kids in real time. 
So that's probably our next step is to get even better at that. Um, we also are, and I'm, I'm grateful to our, we have a great set of principals. We have a, a great director of teaching and learning who have prioritized as part of our, of our work. And so there's scheduled time in the day for this work. And I think that's really important to talk about not adding one more thing to teachers' plates. Um, we're intentional with our strategic planning too, to think about what goes off the plate if we're gonna add something else, because it can't just overflow. Something has to go. And, and, it, and there's things that we maybe have done for 20 years that we don't need to do anymore. And so, we, or do it differently, right? And so that's a big part of our work now is systematizing the work within the work. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, creating that language that you can take from K to 12 is, is really important. And I think it speaks to the idea that um, having, uh, treating SEL like we treat math, like we treat science, you know, if you miss a day of math, um, you need to go back and relearn that because the next day is not going to make sense, right? And I think that when we treat SEL in that way, um, you know, if we just jump into a leadership class, it's it it they'll they'll gain something from it. But if we start at the beginning when we teach, you know, good communication skills, how do you delegate tasks? How do you speak respectfully to people? Um, how do you get to know your team? and then we teach like a larger leadership class, it hits way different. And so um, really creating that um, foundation for students, for young students that they can carry with them up through um, 12th grade uh, or through high school is, is amazing. That's that's great. Yeah. And, and we have a relatively substantial migrant population mm -hmm. in our schools that, that we see in the fall and then we see again in the spring mm -hmm. during uh, harvest and planting seasons. And if we leave to chance that they're going to see some of the same things that their peers are seeing, that's where we have gaps and we have conflicts and we have, we have challenges. And so to, you, you have to be, or even a, a more day-to-day -day example, for some students, as we teach this during homeroom, but then some of the kids are at band mm -hmm. three days a week. Or, mm -hmm. So how are we incorporating that in there? So that's really where our focus has been now, these this last year plus, is where are our gaps and where do we make sure that every student sees what they need to see and gets what they need? Because otherwise we create disadvantages for students unintentionally, but they're still there. Because it, like you said, you jump right into a course that if you, you can't take algebra two without algebra one without struggling a little bit and, and that puts you at a disadvantage and then you're going to measure your success based on something you never had exposure to yet that's not not only is it not appropriate but it's just set up for failure and so um that's where i think that the and i do think for the most part at least in our in our state of minnesota um sel is a is a priority is something that districts are recognizing as a need for students. And, um, and we're working hard to make sure the students have that experience. Yeah, that's great. And I think what you're speaking to is, is keeping our curriculum culturally responsive, individualizing it to the students that are in your school. Um, otherwise it's, it's not going to speak to them on the level that they need it at. And um, I think that, you know, um, when you integrate that into your school, vision, your school mission, um, it needs to, you know, be in every aspect. And I think especially when it comes to SEL, we're talking about um, kind of culturally specific ways that we respond to things, you know, how do you as an individual respond to a certain situation that's going to look different for every student, depending on their own personal experiences, depending on what they deal with every day. And yeah, I think it would be a uh, a disservice to students if you if we didn't um, create it specific to um, the population that we're working with. So thank you so much, Eric. This has been such an awesome conversation. Um, yeah. It's been great to get to know you and and your school district. It sounds like you're doing some pretty amazing things over there, and I I, I look Hello. forward to hearing more about it. <laughs> well, I, I've enjoyed the conversation as well. I think that it's. You know, we, we deal as educators in a pretty important thing in kids' lives. And I, I say that to our staff from time to time, not to be overly dramatic, or, but it's real. These are kids' lives that we're impacting and the future of our, our 
community, state, country, you know, world, wherever, what have you, uh, is in our hands right now. And if we set up kids for success in every aspect of their whole life, uh, then we're going to, we're going to serve them well. And content's really important, but being able to be a human and be interact with others is, is going to be a, it already is, but it continues to be more and more important, particularly in a, in a time like you, we talked about in the beginning where things just have the opportunity to be more divisive. Things have the opportunity to be more um, challenging for kids to navigate. And if they don't have the opportunity to learn how to do that, it's awfully hard to do when you're 25, 30 years old. Right. So, so I thank you very much for the time and the invitation and I've enjoyed the conversation as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. Yeah.